So good afternoon and welcome to this third session of the 2022 WVU Extension Cider School. Today we're going to talk about apple insect management. So I'm glad you could join us today. I'm going to go ahead and kick off this morning with a poll question, uh, which if you've joined us for the other two sessions at all yet, then hopefully you're familiar with this. A little box should pop up and ask you about your role within the cider industry. And that way we can get just an idea of who's in the room, helps address questions and just gives me really good feedback for the future. So when it pops up, this is a multiple choice question, just so you know. So whenever you answer, please pick as many boxes as apply to you and hit that little green submit bottom at, uh, button at the bottom. And then the information should come to my side and I'll share it in a moment. And while the last couple people hopefully are answering those questions, I wanna just go over quick guide. So in order to be considerate and respectful to everybody here attending and our presenter today, everyone does start out muted, just so you know. Um, there will be time for questions at the end of the presentation. So if you want to unmute at that time, please just remember to remute yourself after speaking. And if you have the option to use some headphones or some, some sort of headset, please do so. If you're on a phone, just turn your speakers down so we don't get the echo from the audio feedback. Um, during the session, please use that chat box. I'll ask you questions and you can ask us questions, uh, put your comments in there, all kinds of good stuff. If you have any specific technical difficulties, you can send those messages directly to me within the chat box and I will do my best to answer those and help you out. I'm gonna go ahead and end this poll and share the results. That way everybody can see who's here in the room. Uh, and if you clicked other, please put in the chat box uh, what other means for you. It's very, very useful. Okay. So just so you know, this presentation is being recorded and it will be available on YouTube after I get it rendered and uploaded. Um, I am working on getting relevant materials as well as the recording in our WV Extension online learning community, um, which if you've participated in the Small Farm Conference or Annie's Project, pesticide trainings, any other activities along those lines, you already are familiar with that platform, hopefully. And if not, I'll send out an email here in the next couple of weeks um, when the content is ready to access. And that way you can come back and watch it and go over everything, reach out to the presenters, that kind of thing. Um, so just so you know, this work is uh, on the cider industry is being supported by a Department of Agriculture of West Virginia Department of Agriculture, especially crop block grant. Um, it's titled feasibility study for the West Virginia Economic Development Initiative and in cider apple and cider production, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about that. Um, and if this is your first time joining this particular session, then I am going to ask you to answer two other questions for me. Um, if you've already been here, then I'm keeping track of answers. But the other two questions that we're hoping you'll address and feel free to just toss those into the chat box is what challenges do you see specifically for apple growers in the cider industry and specifically around uh, sweet and hard cider. This is all about hard cider um, in West Virginia. And then what kind of challenges do you see for the wider cider industry in the state? And this is something that we're hoping to uh, put together as that advisory board moves forward and like a cider guild in the future. And this is stuff that could be policy related, could be production related, maybe infrastructure types of things, but anything under the sun that pops into your mind um, that might be a concern or think, things that might need to be addressed. Please go ahead and toss those in the box for us. And now, I think that's everything out of the way. Um, I am so excited to introduce Dr. Terrence Bradshaw, Assistant Professor and Tree, and tree Fruit and Viticulture Specialist, and I'm sure a lot of other things, hats that he wears, um, with the University of Vermont, who is joining us today. So thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. I'm gonna turn it over 
to you. Awesome. Thank you. I uh, hope everybody can hear me fine and get my screen shared up and we'll be ready to roll. We all good? You can see my. Yes, you're in presenter mode at the moment. There you go. Now we're Perfect. good. All right. So, uh, yeah, as Lisa said, I'm Terry Bradshaw. If we ever meet again, and, and I am very uh, accessible online, so feel free to reach out. Um, feel free to call me Terry uh, when we ask questions or whatever it might be. I'm the tree fruit viticulture specialist at University of Vermont. I've been here, um, I've kind of gone through all steps from an undergraduate to staff to master's, and now I run our um, uh, UVM fruit program, which is essentially our research and, and outreach program, extension program. Um, and when I came in, uh, we had a much broader program, it's kind of the story of, of universities and, and kind of the contraction of them um, to where uh, we used to have horticulturalists and pest management specialists and, and food scientists in other areas and whatnot. And um, now I'm kind of the last one standing, but what's really cool about this is um, cider work and um, IPM and Uh, I think Terry might have gotten disconnected. So... <laughs> I was just hoping it wasn't just me. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, give us one second. Uh, we'll see if we can get him reconnected on here. Well, while I try and get Terry back on here, please address those questions for me in the chat box of uh, challenges, <laughs> challenges related to apple production and the cider industry. You can think about those and type them up for me uh, while I hopefully am able to get him back on here.
Okay, I just called Terry. He is getting reconnected. It sounds like it's just going to take him a minute. Oh, there he is. Hey, Terry, welcome back. Okay, I see your mouth moving, but I don't hear anything. So I think you're muted still. There we are. Okay, now we're good. Yes, now you're good. I have no idea what happened there. Um, I got to practice my first two slides. And so I'll be uh, more concise when I cover them the second time here. Um, so again, I'm Terry Bradshaw, University of Vermont tree fruit viticulture specialist. Um, I am the best, worst, and only fruit specialist at UVM. So I cover horticulture, pest management, a little bit of business management, uh, as well as um, some work on, on cider. Not so much on the fermentation side professionally, but I have run a, a cider mill. I used to run a cider mill out of my garage. I called it semi-commercial, sold a few thousand gallons of juice per year to um, home cider makers and even some small commercial ones. Uh, and selling fruit from specific blends that I made. So I'm pretty, pretty used to this, uh, uh, this system and uh, really like how cider kind of brings in all these different pieces. So a piece I want to mention, and this is something that doesn't always get picked up, is that when we talk about cider, I think we'll all agree that the, on the vocabulary of cider now, meaning fermented hard cider, what we don't always agree on is what is a cider apple? Um, and I think there's a little bit of a misnomer in terms of this notion that all of the apples that go into a bottle of cider uh, it are um, these very special, you know, specific cider apple varieties when actually the majority of fruit that go into bottles are cold fruit taken off of packing lines or maybe done a strip pick harvest from dessert cultivar plantings. Um, and that's important to think about in terms of the economics and how we're going to manage uh, that crop. And I'm going to talk a little bit at, at the end about looking at these sorts of orchards and trying to make a decision about whether or not to intentionally grow those fruits for cider making production as opposed to for, um, you know, wholesale or a, a, a fresh apple uh, consumption. The other uh, type of apples are the ones that a lot of people think about when, when there's this notion about the apples going into the bottle, that all of the apples are these specific cider apple varieties, uh, which can be true, but for the bulk of the apples really isn't. However, the economics for these particular types of varieties are completely different. And uh, that kind of brings into, um, brings into play a different set of management strategies that you can practice. Um, oftentimes the people growing these apples in Vermont, there's, there's one, actually in New Hampshire, there's one producer who's produces these on a large enough scale um, that they are growers selling to cider makers and the price is high enough because there's not a lot of these um, that they can sell that these varieties at the full price and not rely upon a secondary wholesale market where they capture most of their fruit or most of their, of their cash. Um, and because they're that much higher value, it changes how you can, you can manage uh, the crop. So I just want to kind of get that out so, to set the stage. An important thing to consider is that orchards, so I work also with vegetables a little bit, um, and a real distinction uh, I talk about with, with my students, a few different distinctions in terms of agriculture. You've got agronomy and horticulture. So horticulture, high value, lower acreage, um, usually high labor, specialty crops, fruits and vegetables. And then we've got um, uh, um, perennial and annual. And the perennial systems, the perennial horticultural systems have very unique needs in, across multiple different um, uh, aspects of the production. But a large piece of this is thinking about pest management because a key tool that we have available in annual systems is crop rotation. And we don't have crop rotation available. I could, I'll rotate this orchard. So this is block 19. I have students that are, that are down hand thinning fruit right now in this orchard. 
this orchard has been sitting in that same spot since 2007, and it will sit there probably until 2027. Uh, and so I have to think about a lot of aspects, fertility and soil management, things like that, but also pest management in a different way than I would think about uh, in a um, in an annual system where I can kind of clean the slate by 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 practicing crop rotation and moving things around the farm. And so we have to think about this this ecology that exists in the orchard a little bit differently. Um, I've been in this business since about 94, 95, which was really when I think a, a, a page was turned in the book of producing apples and, and pest management specifically. Um, the other page of that book was, was turned back in the 70s when integrated pest management started um, and started to kind of become, become a regular uh, uh, thing in this industry. By the time the 90s came around, for various reasons, um, mostly legislative, but also uh, because of extension, because growers were, were asking for uh, other practices to, to help manage pests, we started really paying attention to the fact that there's not just bad bugs or, or um, uh, diseases, you know, disease causing fungi on these fruit or in these trees. There's a lot of other things that are going on in there. And if we try to manage this with the least harmful nudge that we need to, um, we can actually let, I don't like to say nature run its course because an orchard is a monoculture. It is a highly managed system. It is not a system that exists in nature, but there are aspects of natural systems and agroecosystems that help to balance out so that we don't need to constantly be out there with hammers, meaning sprays, spraying pesticides to try to keep managing these pests. So there's a lot of things we can do to try to um, manage pests in a softer way. And by producing cider apples, which have a little bit, um, I'll talk about in a minute, um, which we have a different concept of what that apple should look like, allows us to manage things a little bit differently. So integrated pest management, I've already mentioned, and some of the key concepts around that um, are first of all, pest tolerance. So this apple, it's got a real big coddling moth hole in it. Um, that's not acceptable for any system. That apple uh, is, is either got a, a gigantic worm in the middle, um, it's probably going to abscise and fall on the ground. Even if that made it to um, um, ripening, it's, it, it's gonna rot. Um, so those, so we, we can't tolerate damage like that. But there's other damage that we can start to tolerate and that really changes how we might come into uh, managing our orchards when we've got cider markets on our mind. And that cider market might be a primary market where uh, all the apples are gonna go into, into a cidery. And I already know that when I go out in April and I start to fire up the sprayer and plan my system. Um, or it may be that we have a wholesale market. We're still trying to get 80 or 85%, but we can maybe nudge that back a little bit because we know we have another market for those fruit that are cosmetically damaged. So we can potentially have a certain level of tolerance. This is kind of core to IPM. Um, back before the 1970s, I'd say really the 1980s maybe, uh, you know, any level of, of pest damage was, was considered unacceptable. And that's really, uh, in order to do that, you're going to have to, in Vermont, spray probably 12 to 14 fungicides and eight or 10 insecticides down in the mid-Atlantic, uh, you know, you're looking at, you know, fungicides every seven days from green tip until harvest and the same thing with insecticides. And that's just not a way to, um, not a smart way to produce your crop. So how do we manage this? We understand, we, we begin to understand the life cycles of the pests, what those pests are doing in the greater ecosystem, and then look at all the other different tools we can use to manage them uh, within the system. So this concept of, of tolerance, this goes back to kind of the, the core beginning of, uh, of IPM, this notion that we have a certain level that is gonna cause us economic injury. And uh, there's a point before that where there's a threshold that if we're approaching that, we might have a certain threshold depending upon the pest that we can wait until we get to that before we apply a treatment. And that can cut out a, a large number of, of treatments. And when we have either uh, a cider market or increasingly in Vermont, we've had a lot of changes where 25 years ago, 30 years ago, um, Vermont apples, 85% of Vermont's apples went on a tractor trailer truck and were shipped to a grocery store that could be anywhere from Maine to Texas and some in Europe. Um, 
that is almost completely flipped to where about 20% of our fruit, um, and maybe four, maybe a little higher than that, but um, certainly far less than half um, are going on those trucks, but the majority of them are being sold farm stands locally, maybe on a local truck going to Vermont markets um, and with a lot more story being told around them. So some of that cosmetic damage is um, now more acceptable because you're selling to a different market. And so we actually change our thresholds a little bit and I've changed my recommendations. There's certain pests that I no longer recommend treatment for. And I might have a little asterisk and say, well, if you're wholesale, you need to think about Turner's plant bug, but if you're not, it's, it's no longer part of my recommendation. Um, and that's because we've been able to tolerate um, more damage or more cosmetic damage uh, from certain pests. So the example here, Tyrus plant bug, um, used to be one of the first ones that we trapped for. A lot of growers um, would apply a spray regardless at, at pink um, right before the, uh, the blooms open to manage for this pest. The, the damage is completely cosmetic. Um, and the old thresholds going back to the 80s um, even had this split that you had um, you would you wouldn't treat until um, you had five insects caught per trap for a retail orchard, but you'd treat sooner for a wholesale orchard. Um, and that went on for a long time until, like I say, our growers essentially flipped their markets upside down. And we no longer, I no longer recommend for the treatment of these pests. The growers who have them and know they have problems with them know it and I'll talk to them separately, but there's really only a handful of growers. And if you're growing for slater apples, there is zero reason to worry about this. This causes a, um, a cosmetic, a little dimple in the side of the fruit. Um, I was looking to see if I had a picture, but I don't have one there. Um, that the cider press doesn't care. And in fact, retail or pick your own consumers don't care. On the other hand, we've got European apple sawfly. It's the exact same trap that's used. It's hung at a different time. It's hung a little bit higher in the tree. Um, we have the same thresholds where um, we might have an adjustment based upon wholesale or retail. Um, this is a, one that is very sporadic in certain orchards. Not every orchard gets this, and I'm not sure about down in the mid-Atlantic. Um, but my example here is this is often considered a, get back on there, a cosmetic pest. This is the traditional injury that we think of. We think of this, this scar that forms just under the skin or at the skin. Um, that was the tunneling larva when the apple was, you know, the size of a dime and leaves this, this, this mark that's totally acceptable for use in cider and even a lot of uh, pick your own, although trust me, I've managed pick your own farms and a lot of folks would skip over those. Um, but the problem with this is some of these pests that we consider cosmetic can truly cause uh, damage that goes beyond that. So we lose our tolerance. So this is uh, your European apple soft light damage. Uh, um, in heavy infestations, you'll get a certain percentage of the fruit where the, the larva actually tunnels all the way to the center of the fruit, eats out the seed. That's the frass you see on the, on the outside there, and that fruit will upsize. Um, so you have to know your orchard. When, when we, we did work for about 10 or 15 years, a um, few years ago on organic apple production, and this used to be a tolerated kind of annoyance in the, in the non-organic orchard where somewhere along the way, we would spray an insecticide that would pretty much keep these down to a dull roar. When we switched out our materials and our production system, these kind of secondary cosmetic pests became primary pests. And we had to specifically start to target things differently. So that's an example of where our tolerance changed based upon our management, our, our, our management system. Wrapping that up again. So this notion of cosmetic, fruit injury. Um, some of these, have, there's zero concern for, for cider making. So sooty blotch, like you see in the upper right here, uh, is it's a fungal infection on the surface of the fruit, completely harmless. You can eat right through it. It is ugly as all get out. Um, I have uh, tried to sell fruit that have uh, uh, sooty blotch on them. Uh, I've seen people sell them in, you know, organic markets and they don't sell well at all. Um, so this is very purely cosmetic. If you're trying to do a split market where you're trying to grow as many fruit for the wholesale or for, for the retail, for the fresh fruit market and use just the extra, uh, you know, the ones that, that are rejected for your, for your cider market, this might be one that you don't wanna push too far over the edge um, because you, you, when you push it down to that cider market, you often are pushing it into a lower price category. But some of these other, uh, um, uh, 
some of these other injuries like a frost ring bottom left or uh, apple scab down in the center, a little bit of apple scab. Um, and I say that because too much apple scab. And actually by the time you see this much on a fruit, you're probably impacting the tree, but a little bit of surface fungi um, really is, is not a major issue. If you're gonna ride this tightrope um, of allowing a certain amount in, you could run into that same problem that we had with the soft slide that these minor cosmetic pests can eventually become major pests that are really impacting production and taking those fruit out of any of your income streams. So I, I, I add a little caution to that. Um, certain things, so a lot of our growers who are growing specifically for cider, stop spraying, fun, well, I shouldn't say stop spraying fungicides, reduce their fungicides uh, in the summer that were targeted at sooty black and fly spec. I know in the mid-Atlantic, you're gonna have a lot of other summer uh, diseases, uh, white rots and, and black rots and other things like that. And so I wouldn't say to drop everything out, um, but if you're targeting just these cosmetics, you can, you can really drop those out. But it turns out it's not a huge part of the spray program. Um, I also want to caution, um, there is this notion that apple scab, which is our primary disease up in the Northeast, is purely cosmetic. And I've used this slide in a lot of different talks. Um, there was a data set that I had from many years ago. Um, we, we were not intentionally comparing sprayed, you know, fungicide sprayed and not fungicide sprayed. Um, but I happened to have this data set and I compared them and I noticed that the, the trees that were in this non-sprayed control had up to a 90% reduction in yield. So this is the point I make with this one is, um, what we think might be cosmetic, where we have something like a disease that is feeding on the leaves and actually the leaves drop earlier, you have you know, reduction in photosynthate, um, you can actually get this, this longer term reduction in yield. Same thing with insects, those European apple soft flies that used to cause the, the in, a, in, a, in, a, in a differently managed situation would cause cosmetic things, we've seen 40, 50% of fruit drop. So I, I, I caution, uh, folks on the notion that you can just drop things out and not manage pests because they're purely cosmetic. Okay, another key part of IPM is understanding the life cycle of the pests. And so uh, each of your pests will have a certain life cycle and that will tell you when they are susceptible to certain types of management. In the old days, um, when organophosphates were, were commonly used, and they worked against cotyledon moth and other pests before they developed resistance. It was very common to apply on a calendar basis, um, you know, or it might be on a phenological basis, say petal fall, and then 10 days, and then 10 days. So three, three sprays of a broad spectrum pyrethroid or organophosphate. Um, that worked until the, 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 the target pest developed resistance. But if we, if we look at the way these, that this, in, these insects are, we can recognize that there are certain parts of this life cycle where they are more susceptible to other tactics and maybe more susceptible to um, more narrow range kind of biologically focused materials that would allow us to uh, try to target at a very specific point. So it takes about 250 degree days, base 50 from the moths mating um, to laying an egg and that egg hatching into a larva. So about 250 degree days out, um, you've got this very um, um, tender, if you will, um, larva that is much easier to manage than trying to manage this whole population of flying moths. And there's other practices or other materials that are soft on non-target pests that would work against these larvae. So this is just an example of how we can kind of use these tools. And I'll show you a way to sum these tools up uh, when I get done with uh, you know, a little later on. We can use these, this knowledge to, to soften our, uh, our, our tactics without losing our crop. Another key uh, aspect of IPM is understanding what's in the orchard. And this is where we need to be out there with our feet on the ground, um, really paying attention to what's out in the system. So maintaining a monitoring program, every region is going to have a different pest complex. Um, do not take what, what I recommend in Vermont and, and say, you know, set your traps out, you know, your apple maggot traps out the last week of June. Well, that's probably too late for you. Um, you may have, you certainly have other pests. There's certainly more generations of pests that you need to think about a little bit differently. So if, 
if you were to get my newsletters, I would tell a certain time that you need to stop thinking about or stop monitoring for coddling moth when you folks have another whole generation ahead of you. So caution um, with that, but also pay attention to what's out in the orchard. So traps are uh, very useful uh, to have out there, but also just observations. So we, there's an example of how we monitor our orchards at the UVM Horticulture Center, which I'm the director of. Drop out these pictures and make it hard for me to see. So we have a number of different types of traps. These white traps are um, pheromone baited wing traps. Delta traps are another type of pheromone baited wing trap. Um, oh no, the white traps, sorry. These are the sticky cards that the uh, tarnished plant bug and sawfly, just visual trap, looks like a giant blossom. Um, and then we have our pheromone baited wing traps that are usually for lepidopterans or caterpillars. Apple maggot fly traps that aren't on this slide, I'll show you in a minute. And then leaves, we actually get out and look and count leaves, count the, the, the mites and, and disease uh, lesions that are on, on leaves. And we do this methodically throughout the season. So this is our general map that we have. We'll set our apple maggot traps at the corners because they typically fly into the orchard from unmanaged or even wild hedgerow trees. And we have this, this layout where we can intentionally set this pattern and we alter the pattern weekly. And we do this every week, get out a clipboard, you have the same columns with the same uh, um, traps on there and we can pay attention to what's happening in the orchard. So we can see as codling moth, for example, starts to increase, <clears throat> we know there's a new flight. And when that flight peaks, we assume at that time, this is for second generation, we can assume at that time that about 250 degrees, degree days later, base 50, we're gonna have another flush of, of eggs hatching. So we can kind of time things based upon what we see in the orchard. It also gives us a chance to really methodically pay attention to um, what's happening in there. If we've got fire blight, I wanna catch it the minute those, uh, that those that infections start to show. Um, if I've seen, Oblique banded leaf roller, which is a uh, a moth, you know, another another caterpillar that feeds on the fruit. I want to catch it when I'm just barely seeing them feed on the surface of the fruit, because then I can come in the next day or or that day with with a really soft insecticide like like BT that works only on lepidopterans, and I can snuff it out before those fruit end up with secondary infections from rots and stuff from these things chewing on them. So having a good monitoring program really is essential to this. Uh, more holistic kind of IPM uh, uh, system that we use. So some people don't like the concept of the of the pyramid because um, it suggests that at the tip of the pyramid, this this kind of conventional pesticides are only used after all this other stuff happens, and that's not necessarily true. I mean, we I am always every year going to spray for apple scab. I know it. That's that's given because we're susceptible. Uh, the disease is prevalent in this region and I want to stay ahead of it. We still manage all these other things and we may not go out when we're in the orchard and say, we're going to do our cultural management today. We'll say, well, we're going to prune the trees so that they stay nice and dry. We're going to um, plant the orchard so it's not in the bottom of a bowl where it's susceptible to um, you know, fog settling in and having you know, long wet extended, extended wetting periods. So you know, the, this concept, um, like I say, some people like to argue with it, but I think it does really highlight um, the, the idea that pesticides are not the only way to manage your pests. I know this is, a, this is not a disease talk, but this concept uh, applies as well to insects. So this concept of the disease triangle where you need to have a susceptible plant, a susceptible pest, so either, either a, a pathogen for disease or an insect for, for insect damage, and then a favorable environment, you need all three of those for, for damage, for infection or damage to occur. And so we can look at some different tools. If we understand what's happening in the orchard, if we understand the weather patterns that are happening around us, um, and if we do some different practices, we can potentially reduce the population of our insect or disease pests and without having to hop on the sprayer. So a good example of this is we have been using a flail mower for 20 years now, 25 years now, um, to grind up the leaves every spring. And um, we try to get it in the fall, but most leaves haven't dropped before the snow comes. Uh, and that helps to those leaves to decompose, break down and reduces apple scab. Before we got that flail mower, we used to have a real problem with uh, leaf miner, spotted teniform leaf miner, small insect. It's a really tiny moth. Um, 
it lays eggs on the bottom of the leaf and that egg hatches and then the, the larva eats away at the, the tissue between the layers of the leaves and the leaf ends up basically not being photosynthetic. Once we started using a flail mower for disease management to grind up the leaves and not have an inoculum for, for apple scab, literally, I'm, I'm not even, not exaggerating, I haven't seen a, a leaf miner, uh, uh, a leaf mine in the orchard in probably 10 years. Um, and this is a way that, that we were able to, through sanitation, uh, clean up the orchard, get out, uh, um, you know, areas where, because these, these, these moths would overwinter on last year's leaves. So we, we, could, we could clean things up and reduce our need to manage for spotted teniform leaf miner. Um, being a good grower and managing all the important parts of the, of the plant, um, meaning putting the pest, you know, the, 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 the sprayer and the pest management aside and thinking about what does this, this plant need um, is a real key part of managing for pests. So when we talk about integrated, the integration is the pest management into the overall system um, that's used. And so the example I use here, this is a tree that was heavily drought stressed. Um, we didn't catch that this row, um, the, the, the water line had been cut or kinked, this is years ago, but, um, and so we were, we're watering, we're irrigating our trees and it turns out that this section was not getting watered. And by the time we, we caught it, it defoliated itself. Um, there are certain insect pests and diseases, but I'm re referencing insects now, that are drawn to stressed trees. So these stressed trees will uh, actually put out um, scents. Usually a, a, one of the scents that's, that's produced is, is ethanol, the just pure alcohol. And at a, at, a, at a low level, that's a volatile that comes out that, that, that the tree exhibits and certain pests may come in there. There's a, a borer, a trunk borer, um, black stem borer that goes specifically toward drought or overwater stressed trees. So keeping your trees healthy with the right water, you know, pruning them well, providing the right nutrients is going to make them less susceptible to pests to begin with. So again, IPM, you know, integrating a lot of these different concepts um, to reduce the need to spray. I'll keep moving here. Um, another thing that can be done to reduce that load of pests Yes, um, without having to specifically spray for them in the traditional sense is to consider mating disruption. And this is actually getting a lot more um, uh, traction, particularly for certain pests. So codling moth was kind of the original one that, that, that this worked for, uh, or this was deployed for. Um, there's a few others, oriental fruit moth, which I suspect is a little bit more of a problem um, down your way than it is up our way. Uh, what this does is this is a way to flood an orchard or the surrounding area with the scent of female moths. And then the males get confused because they can't find the female moths because they, they find them um, by way of, of scent. Um, and so therefore no mating happens and therefore no eggs are laid, no larva, no problem. Um, this works fairly well when done on a large scale. So the, the rule of thumb, at least for codling moth in particular, um, is 10, I would even say maybe 20 acres contiguous because you need to flood the area and not have mated moths flying in from other areas. So if you're near an abandoned orchard, this probably wouldn't work so well unless you treat that orchard as well. It's gonna be a little bit expensive, um, but once it's done and you kind of get that population down to a dull roar, a lot of, uh, of uh, farms either apply maybe one insecticide when they used to apply four um, or sometimes even none once they get this, this population down. A particular pest that this is really effective on is dogwood borer. Um, big clumsy moth, I forget if I show it, I don't show it. Um, big kind of clumsy moth that doesn't fly very far. And so if you can do this on smaller acreages and you don't have to worry about an orchard a half mile away blowing in um, uh, you know, mated moths. So that's, that's something that a lot of folks are doing. I know in our region, especially since uh, chlorpyrifos or lorisban is no longer allowable to use, and that was a trunk spray that was used to manage borers, um, this is really kind of becoming the main way to manage for, uh, for, for that particular pest, which is becoming an increasing problem on um, size controlling you know, dwarf root stocks and high density plantings. Okay, 
how do we put all this stuff together? I threw out all these kind of, you know, IPM ideas um, or IPM concepts. The decision support system is really um, a mature um, um, product of what I used to do when I was an undergrad, which was to take information from all these analog instruments and with my boss or for my boss, we collect all this information um, on a chart recorder uh, with temperature and humidity, um, rainfall, whatnot. And we would, we would break out the models and we would by hand figure out what was going on in the orchards and then type up a newsletter. I'm, I am barely old enough to have, where we would actually type them up and stuff them in an envelope and mail growers a report on what was happening around the region. Uh, that's a terrible way to try to use these systems to make management decisions because by the time you have all that information, even if you're collecting it on your own farm, you're days out from being able to make a decision. Well, now we have weather stations and we have um, these models that are available up to the minute that allow you to make some, some decisions. So I select this, I'll click on this and it should bring me right up to um, the NEWA station or the NEWA network which, um, oh, come on now, I don't wanna do that, which uh, is run through Cornell University um, and is a network of weather stations that are located all throughout the Eastern US and a little bit into the West. Um, so heavy in, in, in New York, Vermont was the second state that joined, um, but now we're starting to see them everywhere. And I, there's, there's, I think it's four, oh, there's more than four stations. Oh, maybe it's four stations in West Virginia. Um, this is, I say, the, the, the gold standard for, for applying IPM on the ground. And it's a, it's a fabulous tool that's available that allows you to take this information um, that you've seen in the fields that you, um, that you might see by, through these models and through the weather and put it all together into um, a sensible uh, spray strategy or, or management strategy. So here we are, I just picked one of the West Virginia sites. These are run, I don't know who the West Virginia coordinator is. Um, that will be listed um, near your West Virginia extension. It'll bring you to West Virginia extension. I think it may be listed on the partners page, but I won't, I won't waste your time just clicking through uh, links. Um, but I do want to show an example of one of these tools. So Let's say we're in, in Romney, West Virginia. I click on this site. So this is a physical weather station. They cost about $2,000. Some states have, uh, have gotten grants to place them in uh, orchards around their region. Um, some growers realize that the expense is uh, very much uh, made up for even in one season. And as I explained to some students this morning where a you know, 200 acre orchard can easily put out twenty or thirty thousand dollars per spray once they cover all those uh, those acres. Um, one properly timed spray, or even using the data to not apply a spray, covers for the cost of these stations. The stations last, they say five years. If you replace a few parts and a battery here and there, um, I've kept them going seven to ten years. Spread that out, the cost over that time, you're looking at two or three hundred hundred dollars a year to have an awesome set of information um, that's available on your phone that's backed up by extension from Cornell to West Virginia to Vermont I and mean, we're all part of this network. So this is a station. I don't know if the, the grower who runs this station is, is, is on the call here. Um, I've just selected it and now I can I can look at some of the tools so I can see you know it's 79 degrees and you got a little bit of rain yesterday um, humidity so this is all um, you know, a current reading, you got a quick forecast and this is data that's just pulled down from, from you know, the usual models that everybody grabs. But now we can look at some of these IPM tools and I'll just look at one. Let's look at um, codling moth. So I can take the codling moth. I have, because I have a good, I'm pretending here, but because I have a good monitoring and scouting program in my orchard, in Romney, West Virginia. And I know that my first moth was caught on May 13th. Um, or I should say, NEWA thinks based on their degree day models that the first moth was caught on the 13th. But let's say you were out there and you said, ah, I actually caught it on the 9th. You can set this. You can also sign in with an account. And when you do that, 
and you set this, it stays. So, so this is a way to kind of keep uh, data for your farm in place. So we set that on the 9th and now we're gonna say today is June 8th. Uh, no, I wanna go back a little bit earlier so, so I can actually make a decision. So let's say it was May 25th and I'm thinking, well, am I gonna need to manage my codling moth yet? Well, I know that 250 degree days from that first catch, when I first caught it in my trap, I know that I've got um, that those eggs will be hatching and those larvae will be susceptible to an instant insect growth regulator or one of the other softer materials. I can look at this and say, oh, well, about May 29th is when these are going to be the most susceptible. And oftentimes people suggest applying just a little bit ahead of that. So the materials out there when they hatch. So on May 27th, I'm about 226 degree days. I can put on that one application and manage most of that generation with a single application. Um, that is good IPM, that, that's IPM in action. And that's something that's done, whether you're wholesale, retail, whatever it might be, um, to really narrow down um, you know, your, the, the amount of chemicals that it takes to manage uh, a, a pest or a crop. Okay, I think that's as far as I want you. There's a whole bunch of plunker cure. There's a bunch of other models. Um, and like I say, it's, it's really the, the, the gold standard for applying this to, um, to real life action. And I watched some students, some under, undergrad students through this today because we're in the middle of spray season and they see me spray every week. And I walked through, you know, in the old days we would spray fungicides every single week. And we would have been up to about our seventh fungicide, but yet I've only applied four because we use these tools. Same thing with the insecticides. All right, let me get back to, there we go. There's a few other programs in other states. Um, I made this, this, this parts of this talk before West Virginia joined NEWA. Um, so I'm gonna continue to recommend that you use NEWA. Um, I've also given some version of this talk to a national audience. Um, so I have to kind of highlight that my pests are not the same as your pests are not the same as their pests. Um, I think mine and yours are a little closer, although I'm up near the Canadian border and you're, um, I don't know if you're, you're, you're right, you know, you're, you're, you're in the, in the hot zone. Um, but we have a lot of the same pests that we need to think about, but they may be shifted in terms of obviously how early they are. Um, you, you have your bloom and a lot of your phenology happens earlier. You also have more um, generations of a lot of these pests. So um, it's important to recognize what are the important pests in your region. And to know that, you, you talk to your local extension folks. Um, you have a fabulous um, resource down there at the Carnesville Research Station in terms of entomological uh, research. Um, so you, you really have a good handle on um, what the pests are in the region. So certainly uh, talk to your local folks um, before you take my, don't go on my website and go looking for my spray rick. Recommendations, I should say. So some of the direct ones to think about for us, I could add more for you, um, but the main ones we think about, codling moth, I think is number one nowadays um, in terms of the damage it can cause, particularly near harvest. Um, these fruit, these are uh, ginger golds, have a bunch of codling moth. I bet you most of those um, rot spots uh, have got a codling moth uh, munch taken out somewhere and it allows, allows um, uh, the fungi in to cause rot. But then plum curculio, sawfly, apple maggot are kind of our other big ones. What's really missing on here, I think for, for you, and this is not the issue that it was maybe, uh, was that 2008, nine, brown marmorita stink bug. Um, that's something that has to be managed a little bit more. Uh, it's, it's not a, a manageable pest for us. So I, So again, don't take my typical spray program and apply there because you'll miss one of your key um, pests to that, that you have to think about. There's some indirect pests that need, need to be thought about, but not always, um, when you see them, they shouldn't always be something to think you need to spray. So aphids are a great example, aphids and mites. Um, I see a few aphids all the time. And I, in my 25 year career, I should also say, I do all the spraying at our orchard. I've been a commercial grower for years, um, for some years before I came back to UVM. Um, back in the 90s, I was concerned about um, uh, aphids one time, and I once I, I sprayed for them, and I probably didn't need to, um, because eventually these lady beetles came in and cleaned them up. So some of these 
um, indirect pests that we see. I'm going to plug in my computer because I think my battery is about to jump down. Um, some of these indirect pests um, look a little bit scary, but if we, we give nature some time and we stop spraying uh, broad spectrum materials all the time, nature will tend to, to kind of rebound and, and take care of itself. Um, so that's the, that's the caution I kind of throw at that. The more you spray, the more you got to spray uh, because you take out these beneficials that feed on, especially these indirect pests. But if you've got a real mite problem, you've got a, a mite problem and you, and you still need to treat for those. Um, I had a whole section on fire blight. I know you've got diseases coming up. Um, I'm just gonna mention, just you've always got to keep this in mind. And if you're thinking about specific cider apple varieties from Europe, you're gonna have some real problems with fire blight. Um, in Vermont, it's an annual concern. I've planted and ripped out within the course of four years, um, a lot of cider apples um, because of fire blight. So that's, that's a real concern to think about. This is the thing that I don't want you to take home um, because it's, uh, it may be something to think about, but I think you've got more concern kind of later season, late summer um, than me. So to, to, in Vermont, we're able to kind of target these sort of three windows, which is really, you know, May 1st until, you know, June, July 1st, I would say, um, we can do almost all of our pest management diseases and insects. Um, I would, I would say you might need to think about this a little bit later, but the real thing to, to really take home is um, that you don't have to try to control every single pest you see in the orchard. That's the, the M in IPM is it very intentional that we're managing pests. Um, we're managing this complex and allowing the, um, the beneficials that are in the, in the orchard to do their job, to, to keep these down to a, to a dull roar so that um, you know, the system can work without having to constantly put in more and more and stronger and stronger insecticides, which is what was being done back in the 60s when the organophosphate stopped working against codling moth and um, IPM started right around the time the environmental movement started, but it wasn't the environmentalists that were pushing it. It was the growers who were saying, what do we do now? They, we, we've, we've sprayed for codling moth for the sixth time and it's not working. It's well, because you've sprayed for them six times with the same material and it's not working. Um, if I got a, yeah, I'm gonna spend just maybe two minutes and then I'll take some questions. And I, if, if you're okay going over, I did, I did lose some time. So I'm, I'm, I'm not in a huge time crunch here. Um, I do wanna highlight one thing. And this is a situation where we had a grower, a commercial, one of our larger wholesale growers who contacted me and said, you know, I've got a cidery who wants to buy my apples for cider. These are traditional dessert varieties, not, not anything, no, no, no special, um, especially high value cider varieties. And he said, they will pay me a good price. The price was up in the, I want to say 60 cents a pound, something like that. So, so almost kind of low um, wholesale price for a cider grade apple. They were all going to go into cider. And so he said, how much can I push the limit uh, for, to, for this particular crop to see if I can cut back my sprays without these things all rotting on the tree? So good size farm. We blocked out um, cider. We call cider IPM and standard IPM. So a full program trying to hit fresh market. And then this reduced program where we basically allowed for some, some greater tolerance. We trimmed the apple scab season at the edges. Um, we didn't manage for, we didn't spray for fire blight. This is not a fire blight susceptible orchard. So I would normally not say that fire blight is one of those things that you just manage period. Um, but in this one, you know, growing Macintosh and stuff that wasn't a big concern. Um, home curculio, one spray and then stop after that, stop running the model because we can tolerate a little bit. And then one application of codling moth per generation instead of multiples. And looked at a few different things and we saw a number of things. Um, a few different insects. So the blue is the cider IPM, the orange is the IPM. No surprise, we had fewer insect uh, damaged fruit in the IPM orchard, few more in the cider orchard, um, up to 8% stink bug damage. That was getting a little rough. Disease wasn't that much different, except there was uh, more scab uh, in the cider orchard. And then um, 
interestingly enough, more russeting in the IPM orchard. And I, I, I don't know why that was, what, what, what was behind that. He may have applied a material that was a little bit phytotoxic in there. Um, so we saw, you know, no surprise. We cut back the sprays. We saw a little bit more damage, a little bit more damage. Did that matter? Um, we looked at a few other things. We looked at yield. So kilograms per tree was much greater in the cider orchard. But if we actually looked at tons per acre, this is where you know statistics you know, are, are one of these things that depending upon what you're measuring can tell you different stories. Turns out that the big trees, uh, so the, the trees in the cider orchard were large, either standard or semi-standard trees. And most of the trees in the IPM orchard were semi-dwarf or smaller trees. So when you actually put this out on tons per acre, there was no difference in total yields um, per acre of, of fruit. So we were, we were good with that. And this is a really high yielding orchard. So then we looked at, ran these over a packing, uh, packing line, looked at the percentage of fruit that met US one fancy grade. Um, you know, these were, these were ready to go on a truck and be shipped to a grocery store near you. Um, about 80 some percent for the IPM about 58, something like that, 57% for the cider. Uh, not a real surprise. And an increase in the percentage of fruit that were what we call utility grade. So they weren't rotten, they weren't coals, um, but they couldn't be sold to a wholesale market. So this is, and then roughly similar in terms of fruit that were clean from disease or clean from insects. We were still getting, you know, nine, 90 some percent clean, uh, disease and insects on IPM and, you know, a little bit less uh, on the cider. How'd that matter for the economics? If we were able to take these fruit and sell them into a split market, take the best ones, sell them to the grocery store, take the, uh, the next the utility grade and sell them to the cidery, even at the elevated price that the grower was getting, um, the IPM program where you're selling the most fruit to the highest value market um, made the most money over, and we modeled it out for 20 years. Um, really, we were only down in kind of this range. So the more fruit you sold to the lower price market, that IPM or the, the cider market, the less money you were gonna make. It's just that the price of managing that overall orchard required a price that was higher than they were getting even for, um, the um, this reduce of it, this, these reduced inputs because it turns out that the the sprays aren't aren't a big enough cost that if you cut a few of them out that they're not going to be made up um, by uh, by 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 the money you'll save. If these went into strictly cider, so you stripped all these fruit off and you sold them just to the cidery, including the U.S. fancy ones, you're going to lose money. Just the cost to manage this orchard required was was greater than the twelve or fourteen dollars a bushel they were getting for the cider apples, and so we did this. And the grower, after one year, said, "Okay, I'm out. This is the end of this project," um, because they realized that they had a higher value. Now, if they made their own value-added cider, that could change things up. But then you have other costs involved, um, and so that's kind of a cautionary tale to say that if you have other uh, markets, higher value markets it might make sense to keep selling to those higher value markets. Last slide, um, just highlighting, you can see this is a, an old slide just with the dates on there, but every one of us um, in our regions produces a, a pest management guide or has programs that are extension programs that are unique to our region. Um, and so I really recommend that folks uh, get on the email list, get copies of these guides um, and really pay attention to what's happening in your area. And with that, I think I'll wrap things up and see if anybody's got any questions. All right, thank you so much, Terry, for all of the wonderful information and the resources you were pointing out. Um, hopefully people are able to find those. I did put the one link for NIWA in the chat. If yeah. you all wanna click on it and check out the weather stations that are closest to you. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to unmute and ask them, or you can go ahead and also put those into the chat box. One thing I wanted to note when I saw the, I forget, I did forget to write it down, but a number of people who sell cider um, on this, in this group, uh, as opposed to growers, this is a great way talking about IPM and, and 
um, how growers are kind of using the ecology of orchards to, to, to help them manage their pests this is a great way to sell the product, sell people on sort of the environmental benefit of the, of the cider, of the, the apples that are going into those bottles. Um, it tells a, a, a better story than, um, you know, a picture on the bottle of somebody running their sprayer through the orchard. Checking through, not seeing anything in the chat. So maybe everybody's all finished with lunch and they're about ready to go out and scout the orchards. That is very possible. So I know there was, um, and, and in some of these sessions so far, we've had a handful of people that have said they are beekeepers mm. and they have small scale orchards. And because we're specifically talking about pests, uh, and insects and, and different types of, and, and you've kind of already mentioned the overall ecology of an orchard and what that looks like, especially as a monoculture. Um, can you like shine a little bit of light on if there's particular concerns? I know I get messages and I've worked with some of the beekeeping associations a little bit when it comes to like, oh, don't spray here or yeah. please be considerate. And I know personally, I have, I just have mason bees, but I only have a couple trees. I don't have a real, a true orchard <laughs> right, <laughs> like, right. like some people do. So can you address um, beekeeping at all? Can oh, I definitely like can. Um, I was the chair of our state's pollinator protection committee. It was a legislative committee to spend about a year or so reading all the literature and informing our, our legislators and agency of ag about best practices for, to, to protect pollinators. So I've read a a lot of literature. I'm, I'm not a beekeeper. I've played around with beekeeping a bit. At our farm, we have about 40 hives that a commercial beekeeper um, brings and keeps on the farm. So we've got a 97 acre property. There's only about four acres of apples on there that are sprayed. Um, and so we have to manage in such a way that we're not impacting 40 hives that are, you know, quarter mile away. Um, and that's something you're going to have. You're going to have hives that are, may not be on your property, but are nearby and it's up to you to not impact them. So we do a few different things. I mean, one is no insecticides during bloom. I mean, that's a pretty standard, um, um, in fact, that's on pretty much all your labels. Um, the other thing we do is we try as much as possible to minimize pre-bloom spraying. Um, and that's where I've pretty much dropped out any recommendations for managing tarnished plant bug because that required a pre-bloom application, which will likely leave residue out there for the bees to contact. And the other thing is um, managing inside the orchard. Uh, you know, people often, you know, pollinators are kind of considered this uh, sort of sacred cow of, of uh, in agriculture and they, they can be, but in an orchard, you only need pollinators for seven to 10 days. And for that particular fruit, you only needed it for a few minutes, um, even seconds uh, for the pollination to happen. And the rest of the season, having lots of bees in the orchard while you're running a spray program is actually a detriment. So what we do is we allow um, flowering weeds, flowering plants, I should say, in the orchard. But before we apply insecticides, since it's only a few times a year, um, and we know pretty much when it's going to lead up to, we'll come through and we, we practice, we mow the orchard just prior and knock down all those flowers, um, you know, maybe a week ahead of time so that the bees go elsewhere. The other thing we do on our farm is we leave pollinator habitat outside, but adjacent to the orchard. Uh, and there's been a lot of work that's done landscape level that shows that um, having pollinator habitat within a certain distance, usually it's about hundred uh, yards of an orchard actually gives you the benefits of the pollinators, of all the beneficial wasps and all the good guys that eat the bad guys. Um, without having to bring them all into the orchard to, to spray them, you know, on the day that you do have to spray. So that's a, a way that you can help to kind of manage things uh, and sort of have the best of both worlds. Well, thank you for addressing that. I sure. don't see any additional questions. Anybody else before we close up today? Uh, 
All right. Well, I hope that was exactly what you were looking for, or at least close enough, close, close approximation. Um, feel free. I, obviously, you, you, you know where to find me. So feel free to drop my information in the chat box. Um, I answer questions from all over the place. Um, and if I don't know the answer, which is a pretty good bet, um, I often know who does. So I'm, I'm you know, I, like I say, I do a little bit of everything. Um, but I, I do... I, I rely upon, I think West Virginia and Vermont are very similar, uh, believe it or not. You know, I, I mentioned to people that Appalachia runs right through the state of Vermont. Um, and so the cultures are very similar, but also the agriculture is very similar. We're hilly terrains. We don't have a lot of uh, space where we've got lots of open you know, field crops where we work a lot with kind of specialty and especially tree crops. Um, and so I think our production systems are similar. Um, and, but we all rely upon you know, you probably rely upon your friends at Virginia Tech as much as I rely, rely upon my friends at Cornell to kind of pull in that uh, expertise. Um, so really, I'm a coordinator of that. So yeah, thanks for inviting me. Thank you so much for being here. Yes, I know I reach out to folks all around really the entire Northeast area when it comes to different types of questions related to this, not always just pests, but, but all across the spectrum of our, our industries. Um, Yes, yeah, so I've gone ahead and put the uh, your email and, uh, in the chat if anybody would like to follow up, and I will make sure that's included in uh, in our online learning community information um, that we're putting together. So you can come back and reference it at a later date when you have questions, or if you're just scaling up, or if you are looking for some of those recommendations because you're on the processing end, any of that good stuff. Um, and Terry, I will be reaching out because I have some other questions for you related to other industry things. Yep. Uh, so yes, I'm looking forward to chatting again soon. And uh, if if no one else has anything else they want to mention, so next week we'll be covering another IPM topic, going over Apple diseases and talking about management um, around specifically around disease issues for apples. And then that's really going to be towards the end of our um, production side of um, the sessions. And then we're gonna also have a tour of one of our cideries. So that should be that should be a lot of fun here coming up soon. Um, I, I think that's everything for today. So I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up and stop our recording. And uh, we'll see you again next week. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you.